two, three. It is Saturday, August 23rd, 2008, and we are with retired Lieutenant Colonel William J. Martin, Jr., and this is an oral history being recorded for the Veterans History Project. And with that, I think I will ask Mr. Martin to just tell us about his experiences in World War II and Korea and a vast number of missions that he was in. So, Mr. Martin? Okay. Uh, the day after Pearl Harbor, uh, my friend and I, we worked at Air Research, which uh, then was Mines Field, now it's LAX. And we were, uh, we go to work in this big factory building December the 8th, and it's cold in there. So we're, my friend and I are Ross Stock Inspector. We inspected everything that came into that factory. Inside the factory was a big hot tank, and so we get to work five, ten minutes before time to go to work. We all go in, we back up to this hot tank to keep warm. And one of the fellows says, oh, I saw him where the Air Force dropped a two years college requirement if he can pass an equivalent written. Yeah, that's interesting. So we go back to work. About 10 o'clock, our desks were back to back, and we were looking at uh, sand-casted parts that go into airplane hydraulic stuff. And my buddy looked up at me and says, you think what I am, Bill? And I says, yeah, I'd like to be a pilot in the Air Force. Let's go see what we can do about it. And he says, well, let's see if we can get the afternoon off. We had to drive from there to Burbank Airport. And at that time, driving to Burbank Airport from <laughs> LAX area was called drive. But we're going to go look into it. So I don't know whether we took his car or mine, but we went into Boston and said we'd like the afternoon off to go look in the Air Force. He said, well, you guys uh, not going to cut us short on any supplies. I, oh, no, we're way ahead. And so we drove over to Burbank. And we had to take papers home to our family because we weren't 21 yet. And you had to be 21 at that time to do this. So we did and got a sign and went back. Then we took the written, we both passed. Then we took the physical, and at the end of the physical, they give us a piece of paper and says, well, go here and get your chest x-ray. Well, he had a temporary filling in one tooth, and they says, now you go get that permanent filling, come back tomorrow, and we'll have you get your chest x-ray. And he says, well, okay, Bill and I are going to stay together, aren't you? Oh, yeah, you're going to stay together. So we will pass everything. They... Uh, swore us in as aviation cadets getting $21 a month and a room and board. They give us each a 30-day furlough. Okay, fine. So I go and I'm still working with my dad doing cement work and here I am an aviation cadet, so what? <laughs> and uh, that 30 days had a little time to go and here come a new 30-day furlough. I thought, well, what's going on here? My, my first wife and I, my girlfriend at that time, we're still going to be, I had a Model A Ford with a rumble seat, all fixed stuff. And we're having a ball, mostly roller skate. We roller skated. One year, we roller skated every night and every Saturday and Sunday matinee. Now, on Friday nights, we went to the uh, Shrine Auditorium Skating Rink, L.A. Um, Friday nights, they close at 11, but the roller drum out in, or Saturday night, out in Culver City stayed open until 2 in the morning on Saturday. So we'd all, at 11 o'clock, run out, jump in our car, and go roaring out to Culver City and skate till 2 in the morning. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, my uh, second 30 day furrow had a little time left on it, and here come a set of orders. The order said, report to the red car. Yeah, I don't know how many people remember the old big red street cars in L.A. It took everywhere. Long Beach, Santa Ana, whatever. Anyway, it turned out 361 of us showed up. They put us on these big red cars, and we all looking at each other. We're off in this area. Oh, man, we're going to Santa Ana. They had a big Air Force recruiting station, or uh, induction station. Okay, we're going down there for our initial training. The red cars pulled out of the back at 6th and Main, downtown L.A., pulled out. Instead of going south towards Santa Ana, it went north. And we were all looking at, where is this thing going? And 
It turns out it goes up to Aliso Street and turns right. Well, that's now Hollywood Freeway. But then it was Aliso Street. And it goes right to the big train depot downtown. Here's an Air Force sergeant. Okay, you guys, get out of that red streetcar and get in that train. You're going to San Antonio. <laughs> so we went to the Lackland Air Force, Army Air Corps Station, uh, Air Force Induction Station and Training and a pre-flight. And it tells, when you get through that, they tell you whether you're going to go to navigator training, bombardier training, or pilot training. Well, I think most of us wanted pilot training. We're going like this all the time. So anyhow, we were there about three days. Well, first, the second day, they give us our shots. We walk along both arms. And half the guys were feeling real bad that night. Some of them crying and all kinds of stuff. Then, the next day or the day after, we'd been issued our uniforms, and most of them were in these blue barracks bags under our, we're in tents, living in tents, and there's a hurricane coming in off the Gulf of Mexico. So, two fellas in our tent, there were six of us in each parental tent, and two of them had been in the Army for a couple of years, and they said, if they'll leave us alone, our tent won't get hurt at all. And they had us out working, digging trenches around so the water would go around, putting double stakes everywhere on the tent, really fixing up. No more than got done. The orders come down. All tents will be laid down. Okay, so we laid down. And it wasn't 30 minutes that ripped two or three places. The water come through and the blue barracks bag faded on our uniforms inside. Our <laughs> white gloves, our underwear, and all that, blue streaks, you know, really tough. And uh, they had to do that. Anyway, there's quite a bit of damage in, in um, Texas there, uh, Santone, and what they did, they had us cadets, some of them went down the hill to Kelly Field and laid on the wings of the airplane to break up so they wouldn't turn over in the wind. I mean, they were laying shoulder to shoulder on the wings, and it worked. Uh, I got into a thing that was picking up mattresses and blankets and all that and opening old barrack buildings that weren't usable any other way for emergency people to come out and stay. And we set that up. Okay, then here comes President FDR. He's going to come make an inspection. It was hot, middle of the summer. This is this was about by then. It must have been. Well, let's see when was it? Forty-two. Yeah, early forty-two. But it was getting hot and. They had all the squadrons out on the drill field early in the morning, about 8 o'clock. Some of them in PT clothes, some of us in full uniforms, which I was in, and some of us in different uniforms. And we're all out there. And every time a car would start up the hill, you'd hear a tension, a tension, you all pop to. And some of these fellas, you'd see them start to weave a little and just pass out in the heat with their full uniform, so take them to their barracks. <laughs> the next day, all, not all, but 99% of the guys in the PC clothes were in sick call sunburn. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. When the president, FDR, showed up, he was in a touring car, sitting in the back, came up the hill, drove down this side, across this side, and back down this side, and down the hill. That was a whole inspection of all those guys all that day. So anyway, uh, it was real interesting. The ground school uh, we're going through, one of them was called a psychomotor test. And Ted Williams, the base commander and all that, we're standing on each side of the walk to go into this thing for a test. And here comes Ted Williams with the Commander, he goes in, they said he set some kind of a record with all this stuff. One of the things they did, they had a plate about that big with a curved slice in it, and it would go around like a record player, and this slice would go back and forth, and you had two things you could turn to keep a pointer on that thing that was sliding back and going around. 
and you had to keep it on there. If you didn't, bell would ring and lights would flash, and they want to see, I guess, how nervous you'd get or something. Another one, they had two, like airplane controls, a rudder and a stick, and a thing up in front that had two rows of lights this way and two rows this way, and the, and the instructor behind you, there was two of you going against each other, he could move the lights, and you had to line your little up with the rudder and the stick. And who, the guy I was next to, I don't know who he was, but I had him beat every time. Uh, just good coordination. I've been doing cement work for years. And uh, so, uh, let's see, oh, another one was they had a plate, steel plate, and a Oh, like a long nail and a wooden handle and a wire going, and if you touch, there's a hole in the middle of the plate, and you had to hold this out like that in that hole, and if you touch the edges, bells ring, lights flash, and so you somehow <laughs> go like this. And I forget some of the other tests. There was a whole building full of different kinds, of, and all of it was to see your coordination, your how fast your eyes do things and uh, the whole thing. And they're looking to see, are you going to be a good pilot candidate, navigator, or bombardier? It sounds like an exciting time. And and in all the ground school, of course, there was uh, the one that really gave me a hard time was the uh, code. Uh, what's the name of the song? I can't think of the name now all of a sudden. Anyway, the code, I couldn't get it. I just couldn't get her. So my first wife, she worked on me, and she got it into my head. She got it in my head. She got to know it much better than I did. But she worked at it, and uh, we were uh, married. Well, that's back a little bit. After I left, she had she worked for a telephone company, and she had a vacation coming. So she was told, I'm going to San Antonio to Bill. I said, well, you got to come back, you know, this is a government authorized or whatever business now. She said, oh, yeah, sure, I'll come back. So she comes out here, and the first weekend she's there, we got off on weekends, and uh, we rented a car and drove all around. I showed her all the Air Force Base and all that. Then the next weekend we got married, and I have a picture of the fellow that stood with us in the just a beast in town, and so we got married there, and she really did help me a lot. Then, uh, when I, uh, the last day, they had us all come down to the uh, base theater, and they're going to tell us who's going to go to pilot training, navigator, or bombardier. And I'm sitting there, everything crossed I could cross, and uh, I got pilot training, thank goodness. So, in November 90, 1942, I went to Sykeson, Missouri, primary and PT-19 airplane. Uh, when I got there, it turned out that is a Parks Air College, and they had about six or eight, it's, I got it written here somewhere, uh, oh, it's in this book. Uh, and their uh, headquarters was uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And it was a civilian school, and the military took them all over to train pilots. So all the instructors were civilians, and the check pilots, and the head man there and everything was the Army Air Corps. Uh, my instructor was real good. He, he couldn't uh, go in the military because when he was a kid his dad threw a pitchfork off of a hay wagon that hit his foot and he couldn't march. He couldn't march 10 feet. But he could fly an airplane. Oh man, he had a little clip wing tail cub with a bigger engine. He put on air shows with it. And his whole deal was he got, uh, each instructor had six pilots, six students. And he got all six through every class so far. There was another instructor in our class. I don't know how he did it before, if he even was there before. He wiped out all six of his students. 
But some of the stories they told about what he did was something else. So there's a lot of things that goes on in these things. And uh, we had one cross country and you fly on your land at another field it was a, just a big hay field. They cut runways and taxiways. And so I landed there and when we got all done back, I told to go see the commander. So I went in there and he says, uh, the instructor pilots on the ground says you use excessive brakes when you landed. I did? He says, yeah, so you're going to have to walk some penalties. Well, I did, I still swear up and I didn't, the airplane had the brake squeaked on it quite a bit. And I think that's what they were saying. Anyway, that happened. So, uh, another thing that happened, there was a fellow named McCurdy, and he happened to have the bunk under me. I was on the top bunk, he was on the bottom bunk or two boats you see in their pictures. Anyway, uh, he wanted to be a pilot so bad, but he had no coordination. He, we, during the primary stuff, we would offset him when we do PT so the guy couldn't see that he couldn't do the, <laughs> the exercises and stuff. The first day we went out to fly, that night, uh, we're all in the barracks, and, uh, in the barracks, and this fella comes in. He names all three names. Go see the commander. All three of them were wiped out that day. It was obvious they would not make it as a pilot. And where they went from there, we don't know. They're gone. And the first that night, he cried all night. Kept me awake, but he wanted to be a pilot someday. But that was obvious. Uh, we knew he didn't have coordination. Okay, so we all graduated that did, and then in January 43, 1943, we went to Coffeyville, Kansas for basic training in BT-13s. Uh, old shaky, oh no, that was called Vaulty Vibrator. It shook. It was a single engine, low wing, good plane, and we were the second class there. So after we're there just a couple, three days, they said, well, we don't have a band or anything for, for marching, so we're going to start a drum and bugle corps. Well, a friend of mine who I'd got to know real way says, hey, Bill, you can keep time on a drum, can't you? Sure. He said, let's go try out for a drum and bugle corps. Okay, fine. So we <laughs> go over there, <laughs> and we try out for a drum and bugle corps, and we both make it. So whenever they say, fall out for close order drill, except the band. You guys go practice. So we go back to break. About half of us have played noise <laughs> on the drums and the rest of read magazine, whatever. Gold breaking, oh man. But we did have a pretty good drum boo before and we did some practice, you know, some marching and stuff with it. And like you see all the time, uh, I can't think of anything special. Oh, on uh, in Sison with the PT training, two cadets were in one of these UC-78s, which is tubing and and material plane. Got the edge of a thunderstorm and it tore the airplane apart. They both were killed. So that's one we lost right there. Then Coffeyville, uh, PT-13. Our training was all pretty good. And uh, in March 1943 then, we went to Altus, Oklahoma for advanced training. And that was in uh, AT-17 and, and AT-9s. That was that all-metal little Curtis airplane. Real nice, solid airplane. And uh, just luckily, there were two instructors instructed in the AT-9s, and I was assigned to one of them. Or he was lying to me or something. Anyway, the 89, you got in, there was a door on each side, and you just got in, you had a door. If you had to bail out, all you had to do was open the door and roll off the wing, which never happened. But it was a nice little bit. Originally, that 89 was designed to be an interceptor fighter type airplane, but it didn't hack it. It was not that good for that, but for a trainer, it was good. The 17. 
It was a, you got in the door back of you and to climb up in the cockpit and to get out of that, I don't know how you ever would. It was a good trainer and that's about it. Okay, we uh, graduated there, got our wings and our second is embarked. My wife put on the wings, my aunt put on this second is bar, my mother put on this one. And all of Oklahoma. And then in May 43, that's when we graduated. And uh, had 30 days to lay en route, and 18 of us on the same set of orders were going to Boise, Idaho, medium bombers. And our 30 days to lay en route, we went home, as let's see, in this case, okay, we went home and stayed home. Then we went to Boise, Idaho, and we're going around, the 18 of us are on a bus going around the other runway, and you look down the ramp, and there's one B-17, two B-24s. We're all looking at you, what's this medium bomber? Those are heavy bombers. And so we get in there, and they give us, the 18 of us, one barracks, two-story barracks. We get all settled down about the, oh, the First night, we went down to mess hall to eat, and uh, you go pick up your food, and then they have these long tables with benches on each side. And I sit down, and I start putting a little salt, and well, maybe butter and bread or something. And I hear this voice, and I look up, here's Jimmy Stewart sitting right across the table from me. He, in my book, he did more work in the Air Force than any other notable person. I mean, he worked. He ended up as a squadron commander in England on B-24. He ended up in headquarters helping set up missions and everything. The guy was super. And uh, let's see what, oh, uh, then while we're uh, uh, the, that day, the third day, I get up in the morning and nobody said anything to us. What we're going to do or why are we here or anything. I said, well, I'm going to go down the hangar and see if we can find out something. This is crazy. And two, three, four guys, okay, Bill, let's go. So we got the first door opened up. Here's an airman up there writing our 18 names down on a board that has the line, and it's all set up for, like, mission. You know, doing whatever. So I said, hey, 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 what's going on? That's us here putting up. Oh, these guys are all going to Casper, Wyoming tomorrow. What? We just got here. You're going to Casper, man. So, sure enough, next day, early, we're on a train. It got to Casper about noon and put us on another bus. And we go in there, and here's this hangar, and it's full of people. And there's a major stand up on a stand thing, and, and we get off the bus and I hear him. Oh, here they are now. There's 18 second lieutenants, brand new, didn't know what we're doing. <laughs> Why are we here? What's going on? And this major said, Okay, when I call out the aircraft commander's name and your name, get together with him, and you're his co pilot. Really? On a B 17, I haven't seen one except pictures. <laughs> and that one on the ramp but Boise. So anyway, we're a B-17 co-pilot. So the first thing, I was assigned to a Donald E. Bates. And I'll tell you a little story about that in a minute. But first words to me were, Bill, you start studying this airplane because if something happens to me, you're going to be have to bring us home. Okay. So I got the maintenance manual and the pilot's manual and started studying the B-17. And I got, I ended up as an instructor pilot on everything. I'll tell you all about how that happened. But this crew, to finish their basic training as a crew for combat, had to have, the pilot had to have an instrument check, the navigator had to have a 500-mile over water mission, and a bombardier had dropped three more practice bombs. We call them blue devils or blue practice bombs. I don't know what they weighed, maybe 200 pounds or something. Anyway, so what they did, they said, okay, 
Don, the next day, tomorrow, you're getting your instrument check. So my first experience in B-17 is standing behind the pilot seat watching him get an instrument check. <laughs> and he passed it, of course. Then they shipped us down to Biloxi, Mississippi, middle of the summer. Here we are, May, June, probably May. <laughs> Hot, stuffy. Oh, man, the humidity is as high as the temperature or more. Anyway, they put the three bombs on board. And we're going to go out over the Gulf of Mexico, into Galveston, Texas, back out again, into Biloxi again. And there's a bombing uh, gunnery range out there, and he said, okay, drop your bombs out there at 20,000 feet. Well, we might have been this high off the ground when we went across that island. And the bombing here had his foot up like this, and he said, okay, one, two, three, <laughs> drop the bombs. So we did it. Got back there to, uh, <clears throat> oh, I missed something here. Uh, after Casper and assignment and all that, we were sent to Kearney, Nebraska, and went to, we had six days of laying route. Now, my first wife, by this, she had been sick at Boise, and the people there took care of her like it was their daughter. And when she got well, she came to Casper and we passed each other on a bus. <laughs> Didn't know it. And I'm not sure yet how we got together. But it turned out she gets a Casper, and she, like she'd always done, she'd get a job or something. And she rented a, a little apartment from this woman. Uh, I won't tell you what I think of her. But anyway, we got together some way. So I'd go back to Casper real quick, and we stay there four or five days. She wouldn't give. She had paid a month in advance, and she wouldn't give nothing back. And we weren't there, I'd say, four days together. And then we went back to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and put her on a train coming home, and I already called my dad and asked him to meet him and take care of her. And I went to Kearney, Nebraska. When we get to Kearney, that's where we're assigned to B-17. And you look out, and all the way along the exactly, is B-17 parked on each side. And they're assigning them to these crews. And we're assigned a brand new B-17. Boy, this is nice. <laughs> so the next day we come down, and two or three tail numbers are changed, and our tail number was another airplane. Oh, okay, fine. We go down the ramp. Here's this beat-up old B-17, got 300 hours on it. And Oh, uh, the toolbox had been opened, some of the tools were gone, the navigator chair was gone, so we we're really teed off. And here comes this master sergeant, he's the head guy out of the line. He's got stripes this long, I don't know how long he's been in the Army and Army Air Corps. And He's coming and we're all waiting down and we're talking to him like, boy, this is training, this is terrible, oh, what's going on? And he says, just a minute. He says, you see that airplane? He says, it's got 300 hours on it. You know it flies. Well, yeah. That airplane has real right engines on it. Those new airplanes have Studebaker built engines. Oh. <laughs> Okay, he says, I'll get you all the tools you can use. I'll get you a new seat for the Navy, no sweat. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll be glad. And so that's what happened there. And that's when I, they were told, you know, they had to finish their missions before we could go anywhere. So after Biloxi, we got back from doing that. We get to Biloxi, and they sent us over to... Florida. Oh boy, I can't think of it. It's got nine fields over there. I just can't think of the name of it. But anyway, they sent us over there to put anti-radar equipment on our airplane. Then we had to fly out over the Gulf and back a couple of times testing. But when we landed there, our Eglin Field, Florida, that's it, Eglin Field. And when we landed there, our tailwheel disintegrated. Just a second. Uh, it turns out there had been some bad casted tailwheels, and they thought they had changed them all, but they had missed this airplane some way. So now we have to wait till they find that. 
another wheel, get it up there, and I finally found one way down south end of Florida. I flew it up there in a little airplane. <laughs> so we're stuck there, Eglin, for, I don't know, several days. Then from Eglin, we're supposed to go to Bangor, Maine. And now we're headed overseas. We don't know where yet. This, you go to Bangor, Maine, and you go to Newland, and you go to, where we went to Irish Scotland. Anyhow, we, on the way to Bangor, first we go over to the navigator's house. We called him Lockheed Hudson. His name was Hudson. We called him Lockheed. A big, tall guy. He'd gone to Tennessee University, and he was sharp. He was a good navigator. We went over to his house, and it's out in Thule's. And we buzz his house, low. We get a letter later from his mother, and she says, you know that loose plaster in the ceiling in the kitchen? You guys knocked it off. <laughs> That's how low we were. The second place was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The assistant engineer who was a ball ferret gunner, but we couldn't go that low there. Well, we still buzz it a little lower than we're supposed to. Then the pilot's home was up in Maine somewhere. I don't know exactly where, but somewhere in that area. And it's a big two-story house, and we're coming from the south, coming up, and the house, when we come over, the roof was like this, just the way we're coming. And Don says to me, he says, Okay, Bill, when I tell you, give me high RPM, and I'll put some power on it, and we'll buzz the house. So we're coming like that, and the bombardier, when we're traveling like that, he has nothing to do. So he would make kind of a hammock out of some bungee cords and lay back up in the nose sleeping <laughs> half the time. So he was up there sleeping, navigator told us lately, later. <laughs> we're coming down over this house, and we come over the house, and as we stuck the nose down, he said, okay, now, and I gave him high RPM, of course, he puts a power, and it roars. And the bombardier woke up, and here's this house and trees coming. <laughs> and the navigator said, man, you never saw anybody scratch from the back of an airplane. <laughs> but when we went over the house, then we turned, and there's a big grassy meadow like out in front and a big lake. This house is beautiful area. And there's a guy in that rowboat out there fishing in the lake. And he ducked down the bottom of the boat when we turned around him. <laughs> And we went right down this grassy thing to the side of this house, and his mother, father, and sister, young, fairly young sister, standing out there waving. They saw us wave through the windshield at them. And then up over the house, we went into Bangor, Maine, and you get there, and you get supplies you need or whatever, and they load you up with fuel, and you fly out to Newfoundland. And by this time, we're in what they call a provisional group replacing crews overseas and uh, when we get to Newfoundland there's airplanes parked on all sides but by this time the rest of them are gone because we got stuck with a tailwheel we got stuck but once before so we're way by so anyway we get to Newfoundland okay fine and they we stay there and get rest overnight. Then next morning we take off for Irish Scotland. It took us 14 hours and 20 minutes. And we can't fly over the weather. You fly, it just happened to be we flew between two layers of clouds and that made the navigator's job real tough. He couldn't get drift off the ocean. He couldn't get the stars and, you know. But he worked all night. The rest of it took naps and everything else. But we had about uh, I don't know, a little while ago, about an hour maybe, and uh, never called up and he said, hey, Don, go below this cloud layer, and he said, we ought to see land in about 35, 45 minutes. Okay, fine, so we dropped down. 45 minutes, okay, we don't see no land. Whoa, did we miss Scotland North and go to Germany or somewhere <laughs> going to be? Prisoners for starts, and then somebody, I guess, bombed here and navigator, hey, there's land up there, okay. We could have just put the gear down and land on the runway if it had one that direction. We hadn't turned a little bit. But what happened was the weather people back in Bangor and Newfoundland had given him 
the wind's 180 degrees out of A. So instead mm -hmm. of a tailwind far away, we had a headwind. So that's why we we're late. But boy, he had us right on dead center on that runway. So we landed there and overnight, we get up next morning, we're supposed to go to the southwest corner of England, a place called Nuki, N-E-Q-U-A-Y. And we're pre-flighting the airplane and I got the left side and Don got the right side and the engines have a big shaft comes out like this and a turbocharger they call them now. There's a wheel like this with all these fins and that's where the exhaust goes through and it spins this charger up there to put more power in the engine. I flipped this thing and it's supposed to go around nice and smooth. This one goes like this. Hey Don, come here. <laughs> I hollered at Don, he comes over here and boy, I've never seen anyone do that. So we call the maintenance people out and they come out and go, well what happened was at uh, Ayr, Scotland, when we got up that morning, the engineer says, hey, how about me checking the engine before we take off? Checking the mag. Okay, fine. So we're laying, but Don and I are laying out on a grass slope and he started the engine and warmed them up. Hey, checking the mag and he gets the number three engine and you check the mag by going both left, both right, both. And they run on both. Of course, you got two plugs in each cylinder and two mags and everything. So he's checking them and he goes both left, okay, both right. And when he goes right, it goes bam, bam, backfired twice real quick. So he put it back to both and it run fine. So he opened them with a holler down. What do I do now? I tried it at 2100 RPM. He's doing it at 1800 there. Okay, so he goes up 2100 RPM. He gets over right and then it goes bam, 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 hard. Back to both, shut down the engine. Maintenance people come out and our engineer gets up there to it and they open up and they find one of the wires on a mag is loose. So when he went to both, it was like shutting it on and off. So they tightened that up, started up, rechecked it, checked fine. Okay, fine. So we get in the board. We fly down to Nuki, England, right on the coast on the northwest, right down to the bottom. And uh, they'd had this place open for our uh, American planes coming through to Africa about a week. So we landed her. The next morning, we got about 5 o'clock, I'm checking, or no, I'm sorry. We told them when we got there about this engine backfire. So the engineers go out and they're looking, oh, you got a bent shaft. You're going to have to have that fixed. You'll be here till we get it fixed. Well, why can't we fly over to the main depot at London? We want to go see London. <laughs> No, you can't fly there. We just flew it down from Scotland, no problem. We'll just leave that power back. No, we're going to fix it right here. Well, having only been there a week, they didn't have a lot of the stuff they had to get it sent over. So we're there for, what oh, was almost two weeks. And to start with, the cook at this hotel we're staying in, or I don't know, I think it was a hotel. He's getting American rations to feed us, but he's feeding us British rations. And it's uh, what what they call sheep uh, mutton. mutton, mutton, mutton grease. I think he cooked everything. So about the third day, we're screaming. We're we eat dinner. We're hungry. We go downtown. All we can get in town is fish and chips. But we need some fish and chips. Something. So anyway, we got him kicked out. We started getting American Imagine. Okay, then time they changed that engine and everything, about two weeks, now we're really behind the other group. They're already there. So we take off from there on my birthday, 29 July 1943. We fly from Southern England to Marrakesh, North Africa. And that's the first place I made a landing in the B-17 was in Marrakesh? I landed at Marrakesh, and you know, went right over to the apartment buildings and down their gravel runway. 
But we got there, okay? And uh, from Marrakesh, we stayed there overnight. Next day, we went to Oran, North Africa. And Oran was a big depot where airplanes that couldn't be fixed by the squadron would be sent. Or uh, like when we got there, uh, it, what they call con setting it up for combat. And they took some things off, put other things on, I don't know. But we get on the ground and our radio operator, he was an Italian kid from New York. And time my pilot died, Don and I got out of the airplane, he was standing there and his face was white as sheet. He said, I'm not going no farther. The airplane next to us had been brought in because it had holes shot from the radio room, just in front of the radio room, which is just back of the Bombay, all the way to the tail, it was just full of holes. He said, I don't know, no. well he had to, he's on flying status just like we were. So there we were, and uh, I don't know the date, but anyway, our base, we went to our base in Pont du Faz. I don't know if I'm spelling it right or not, but it's 36 miles south of Tunis. That's where our first base was. But in the meantime, I got sick. Oh man, I think it was, I'd never been told how to wash a mess kit, right? And we were eating out of our mess kit. I think that's what, I don't know, but I got sick, man. They took me in the ambulance to this house, had one room with a roof on it, and the rest of it was all shot up. And this doctor looked at me, here, then sit down. He put a chair on me, and I sit down. And he said, put your hands out. And I go like this, and he starts filling them with white pills. I mean, I don't know how many of them. Bunch. He says, take them. I said, all of them, come on. Yeah. So I started taking them, and I got about half of them down, they come back. Anyway, he got me straightened out, though. So I got back finally to our outfit. And that's when let's see, I started flying missions. And as I put down here, oh, okay, that reminds me real good. My first two missions were to Foggia, Italy. And we're supposed to go to the airdrome and draw them the airdrome for two days. And just as we're getting in the airplanes to start in, here come a jeep running around, drop your bombs in the middle of Foggia. The German high command's there on a big meeting with the Italians, we're gonna get them. So we bombed Foggia, the city, two days. And later, we're stationed there. <laughs> okay. So, uh, that was the Foggia. Then, uh, my third mission, Campo, Italy. Then, RT, Pizza. Uh, this Pizza mission, I think, I, it's August. The uh, first mission was August 19th, uh, 1943. Yeah. And the second one is the 25th, 26th, 29th, 31st. Uh, one of these pizza missions, I don't know if that one or another one. Uh, I think it was later. Probably the one on um, September, or no, October 4th. I'm pretty sure. What happened there was we're going to pizza and uh, I think the airdrome against the city was declared an open city. We're not supposed to ever drop a bomb on pizza. So we drop our bombs, and just so we turn off, we lose an engine. And Don and I switched flying, you know. So he's flying it, and once we head home, normally our bombing formation is the leader's right here, and we're just a straight line each way, and we just saturate whatever we're bombing. Then in route, we go three airplanes, three airplanes, three airplanes. And if there's Taylor and Charlie, he goes wherever he wants to, <laughs> usually back here. But uh, as we're flying, just as we come start off the coast, headed toward Corsica and Sardinia to go down back to Africa, uh, a whole lot of flak came up. And the intelligence, when we go back, had no idea why at that particular point there was all this flat. Anyway, uh, 
we're flying along and for, we're right here. There's an airplane here and here and three ahead, three underneath. And we're out here and Don's flying at that time. And all of a sudden we hear Brr! And a piece of flak, it turned out later we found it. About that long, about that big square and just rugged, you know, just a hunk of metal off the flak bomb. And it bounced off the autopilot box under my seat, that deflected the Don seat, went right up through and hit him, and I won't tell you where, <laughs> it hit him, and he said it felt like a Missouri mule kicked him, and he just went straight up and let go of the airplane. Well, when he did, it started to bank like this, and here's an airplane up there, there, and there, and I'm just like this, full left air on all the rudder I can get, and I can't do nothing else, there's no way. And the bombardier up front starts screaming, we're going to hit him, we're going to hit him. And next thing out of Don says, shut your mouth, Hume. <laughs> and so I knew he was pretty good, but boy, he had gone up off that seat. And we're still at 22,000 feet or so on auction, a little bit. And I look over and Don's just sitting there. And all I can see is his eyes, you know. But he's sitting there okay. Anyway, uh, we get down to uh, 10,000 feet and you always take your mask off when you get to 10. And we're, by this time we've lost, when we when he got hit, an engine got hit, and now we're on two engines. And so we just head straight for Corsica, because there's an airport there, and then the south of Sardinia, going south toward Africa, there's an Army Air Base, Army Air Corps Base down there. And I didn't tell you yet, but we got stuck in Sicily for five days, seven days, and missed five real easy missions. So we put up to the crew, do you want to go home or do you want to land at Sardinia or what? Well, by this time we had leveled at 7,000 feet and everything was normal on the other two engines. They said, well, let's go home. <laughs> but, you know, here we are, uh, I don't know how many miles it is from the end of Cor uh, Sardinia to North Africa, but it ended up we flew a little over 400 miles on two motors, two in. <clears throat> Anyhow, by this time, Don had moved over in the right seat, and I on the left seat, and when uh, we got to 10,000 feet, I don't know how to say this, uh, he and the bombardier and the radio operator went back in the radio room and they examined him where he got hit. And they come up with the funniest look on their face, and I ain't going to say it. But they couldn't <laughs> find the flag. And they thought it disappeared. Anyhow, we finally found it on the pilot's cushion. I'm sitting on, we had a K-pop cushion, you used to sweat that thing, sweat like anything, when it was warm enough. And Anyway, we found it in there later, but uh, Don got a purple heart in a little bit. He, he had some scratches and stuff. <coughs> but uh, I was going to tell you about another mission. I can go on and on about these things. Um, we went out one day uh, going across the Adriatic, or the Mediterranean, uh, going north, and the leader, the lead squadron, we were the left squadron, there's another squadron on the right, we're a group, a whole group, and there's four squadrons. And the lead squadron went in a hole in the clouds, but there was no holes out here. And we went in a cloud. Well, it just happened that just as we were about to go into this cloud, Don had gone back to the restroom, uh, <laughs> just a tube outside. Anyway, so as we go into this cloud, I notice the lead airplane starting to turn left, and we're out here in the middle. There's one up here and one down here again. So I thought, well, I'll just turn a little more. Well, I'd never been told, taught how to fly instruments very good. We weren't in training, ever given good instrument training. And so I'm almost certain I can't safe or positive, but I'm almost certain I turned that thing into a spiral. Mm -hmm. And I think we went down 
and just kept rolling over and we come over we're going so fast and that airplane built all lift and it just went like this and right out the top of the clouds and about five or six other airplanes and we all got together real quick and just turned headed back to North Africa because you know he's trying to go that way over a bomb run. So anyway we went home from that one. Another, uh, there's stories in most of these. These flew 53 missions? 53 missions total. I got them written all right down here. Anyway, uh, another one, the one I was talking about where we got stuck in Sicily, we were going to uh, Athens, Greece, and it's a long run. And we got, oh, I don't know, just past Sicily a little ways, and we lost the engine. Well, there's no way we can go on that far on three engines. So we turned around to go home. Just so we turned around, another engine quit, and it wouldn't feather. So when an engine don't feather, it propped out their windmill. It's like having a big hunk of drag out there. I mean, you know, and we're losing about 100 feet a minute with the engines as high as we felt like we could run them out, burn them up. And so we're going along and we're coming, just starting across Sicily and a, a navigator called up and said, hey Don, do a 360 so I can bail out, will you? He said, what do you mean? He said, I got it figured we're going to be about 150 feet below the ocean when we get to coast of Africa. Oh. Okay, I guess I better land here. Well, we'd had Sicily in our hands about a week, and they were lengthening the runway at that time. They had knocked down a wall on each end, and so Don says, I'm going to make a power off landing. Okay, fine. But he held 1,500 feet instead of 1,000. I'm looking out the window, and smoke is a tailwind, and we get up awful close runway, I thought, and he shuts the power off, and we got the gear down, the flaps down, and everything, and he sticks the nose down, and we're picking up speed, and we're already past the end of the runway. Woo! And it's just like me watching a big movie. He comes down and lands, and we're rolling along, and here's this wall where they've knocked down, and there's still some rocks there, and we bounce the main gear over the rock, and they had plowed this field out there and there was a big canyon at the end of this plowed thing. Well, the pilot in the B-17 that pushes the hardest on the brake puts them on. I was standing on them and I weighed more than Don did. And uh, I got pictures of Don right here. He's kind of a thin guy. Uh, anyway, we stopped maybe 10 feet from this drop in this big canyon with rocks and trees and a whole bit. So we started getting out of the airplane. When I dropped, I dropped out of the hatch. And there's a hatch right underneath the cockpit. And I dropped down there. When I hit the ground, my legs didn't hold me up. I just in a big pile. <laughs> my teeth started chattering. It hit me <laughs> how close we'd come. But we got stuck there for five days, seven days, but five easy missions. And so from then on, the crew didn't want to stay away from home if, if we could keep from it. And, uh, okay, uh, there's a lot of stories. Oh, another good one. We went to Greece another time, and we had 1,000-pound bombs on board. So I had six 1,000-pound bombs, and we're going to knock out the airport at Athens, Greece. So we get over the bomb and we start dropping. Well, when we do, the co-pilot watches the light on the dash, if there's no fighters or anything around. He watches the light and it counts how many bombs get dropped. Each time one drops, the light flash. So the light flash once, twice, three times, and that airplane shook. It just, oh man, it shook all real bad. Don says, Give me battle damage. And just about then, the sixth bomb fell, and again it shook worse. He said, battle damage, battle damage. And just then the radio operator said, don't close the bomb bay door. And I turned around and looked, 
between the legs of the top turret gunner right behind me, and here this sound palm bomb is sticking out in the air. The, there's a protective thing with a little prop and pulled it off. All you have to do is touch it and go off. Sound palm bomb. And there's fighters around now. And so we look at each other, well, if we stay in formation and that thing blows up, we're going to get the airplane next to us. Should we drop out? If we do, the fighters are going to get it. And the bombardier says, I'll get it out of here. <laughs> and he comes back, and he was real worried because he had had to load the bombs because when we moved, we're up in Italy now, when we out there, when we moved, our barge with all the squadron stuff got sunk coming across to Italy from Africa. So here, and the crew, the uh, all the guys that do the loading the bomb stuff hadn't got there yet. That was the main thing. Anyway, uh, so the bombardier was dead back there, and uh, he has to get on this little narrow walkway and reach across with one end like this and then defuse the bomb this way. and. At 22,000 feet, he has to have oxygen, so they send all the walk-around bottles with walk-around bottle and bottle like that. And all I can get him, by this time we've used oxygen so much, is all I can get him in each bottle is about two and a half minutes at the most. So we're switching bottles, keeping him going. Anyway, he defuses it, throws the fuse, and I don't know how up to this day, but he got that bomb kicked loose. And he comes up with a shackle in his hand that holds it. It's a big thing about this long, got some hooks, and it, it's what releases the bomb. And he grinning from ear to ear, and a piece of flak had come in and riveted this one release. It couldn't release, there's no way. So it wasn't his fault. So he was happy about that. I bet he was. Yeah. And. No, I can tell a lot more stories, but the big thing I want to tell you about is my last mission. Last mission? 53rd mission. I'm, by that time, well, no, I'll tell you one before that. Uh, they checked me out as aircraft commander in Italy, and ca I didn't tell you this, but my first two missions, I flew co-pilot for Captain Simmons. On this day, we're going to southern France. I flew with Captain Sims again. Only this time he says, Bill, you remember your first two missions? Oh, yeah, I don't know. I'd had maybe 20 missions by then or 25. He said, I said, sure, I flew with you. He says, you, you remember who did all the work? No, what do you mean? He says, well, I think you raised the gear and set my flaps. He says, guess who's going to do all the work today? Oh. He says, you. He says, I'm going to sit over there, and if you ask me something, I'll do it. If you don't, I won't. Well, what it turned out to be was, he was checking me to see if I should be an aircraft commander. That's mm -hmm. what he was doing. Yeah, really. And so we went to southern France. Every time we went to southern France, they thought the, the uh, invasion was coming. And they'd send up everything they could get. Well, a real good friend of mine, his tent was right next to ours. His stepdad was the biggest law library and printing firm in New York, and he was going to set up an airline, and I was going to be their chief pilot. His son was going to be CEO and owner, and he was two airplanes in from me, and the leader of us, they didn't drop their bombs the first time we went across. So this guy makes a big circle, the same altitude, same airspeed, same heading, and boy, those German guns had us pegged. And this friend of mine, two airplanes in, got a direct hit between three and four engines, uh, black, and caught on fire, big fire. I raised up, the plane below me dropped a little, and he went between us, and we could actually feel the heat of the fire when he went by. Uh, you can figure that at 23, 24,000 feet. And none of them got out of that airplane. It, it rolled over once, leveled off, rolled again, and it went level off the second time. It was just a big flash. Blew up. So that was that. Now, my last mission. We're going to Verona, Italy, up at the end, north end, the biggest marching yard in the whole area.
the railroad Boston Yard. And we're going to knock it out. So we go out and fly right up the Adriatic Sea. And at the end of the Adriatic Sea, hit the IP and start in. And well, just as we hit the I had a brand new co pilot right seat, his first mission. Uh, they sent him over now. We split up a crew but 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 guys have been there a while. And <clears throat> he's counting. And he counted twenty. I said, What are you counting? He says, those, those fighter planes coming out of the I said, Shut up, you counted too many already. <laughs> well I was flying left wing of the group commander. So I put my airplane in so close you could walk my airplane to his, and I held it there. Uh, the B-17, I can show you the picture in there of the cockpit, uh, had the best throttle set up, I think, for four engines. Uh, you get the top two, you got the two outboard engines, grab this, and in the middle there's all four of them, down here's the inboard. So if you're flying a nice smooth formation on a smooth day and everything, you get it all set up, you can just take the inboard, just ease them back a little, or push them ahead just a little, stay right in there. But I grabbed all four of them, and I'm keeping that thing right there. So we get back out of there, and we start back down there, say, going home, and this lieutenant looks over at me a minute, and he says, Lieutenant, do you always fly that close? I says, hey, that's my last mission. And I attribute at least half of it to flying tight formation because the fighters can't get through. They got to go over under, and they know all them guns are going to shoot now. I said, if you don't learn how to do that now, <laughs> you're going to be in trouble. So we go back and land. And when you land, they take you into intelligence and they debrief each crew. So we get in there, all the tables, I think there were six of them, I'm guessing about that. And they were all full. I said, okay, Bill, sit down over there, we'll get you in. I can remember sitting and leaning back against this big Quonset hut, and just sitting there and resting. And this fellow said, okay, Bill, you're next, come on. My mind says, go to that table, and I didn't move. And what? I just didn't move. And so two guys help me up, and I go to our table, and we debrief, and here comes a flight surgeon. He's out there watching and all that. He comes over and he says, well, Bill, what happened? I says, I don't know. I says, I, I thought I'm going to go walk over there, but I couldn't move. He says, heck no. He says, for the last 10, 15 missions, you've been flying on nerves. He says, you know, you're not going up on a mission tomorrow or the next day. Your nerves just quit. He says, and tomorrow you're going to wake up with the worst headache or worst cold you ever had. I, you're kidding. I feel great. Boy, the next morning I couldn't breathe. I, oh, I had a cold. <laughs> then they made us, any time we finished, they made us a test crew. We'd test fly a different airplane to come in or whatever. So, out of our crew, there was ten of us in a crew, ten in a crew. Uh, eight of us came home to get it. But one of them, uh, the assistant engineer who was a ball turret gunner, he'd been on another airplane and one bullet hit the airplane and hit him right in the head. Mm -hmm. Killed him. Another one, we made a short mission. We took off from Foggia and flew across Italy westbound, climbing to get up to altitude. Came in, dropped our bomb, and we flew a total of an hour and 45 minutes and got credit for a mission. But another crew member of ours, I forget which one it was, I think it was a, I don't know. Anyway, he was on another airplane, and it, just as they come off the coast of Italy, two ME-109s come down and just raked that airplane, and they all bailed out. Yeah, I mean, it ruined them. They all bailed out. So he was taken prisoner. He saw the boats coming out and picking them up, and he was a prisoner of war. So when we finished our missions, the eight of us, we got orders. Report to the transportation officer in Casablanca. Okay, fine. How do we get there? <laughs> I don't know. You get there. You got to be there. We're in Italy. We got to go to Tunisia and cross Iran. And try. How are we going to get there? Well, the navigator heard 
about an airplane that was going to leave Barry, Italy the next morning, and it had eight empty seats going to Tunis. Oh, great. So we thumb a ride in GI trucks and get down to Barry. Next day we get on there and we go to Tunis. He said, now I get to Tunis, I can't take you any further, that's it. So we get off there. Now what do we do? Well, we heard about a Red Cross train. It's going to leave Tunis and go to Oran. Great. So we get on this train. And if he's going 10 mile an hour, he is really moving. And then he'd stop. It seemed like every other, every now and then he'd just plain stop. Oh, what the heck's going on? So, here goes a GI convoy down the highway, and they're making tracks. And the navigator says, I'll see you guys in Oran. And he throws his bag out the window and jumps, and we all do the same, right behind him. So we get on these GI trucks, and they get to Oran. Now out of Oran. Now, how are we going to get to Casablanca? Well, we hear about a general who's got a C-47. He's going to Casablanca tomorrow. And so we go start talking to his aide, and he said, oh yeah, he said, we got eight empty seats, come on. And we got on that thing, and that was the bumpiest day. This C-47 was all over the place. Well, his crew, you know, his staff, or ground pounders, they're not used to this flying business. There's a second lieutenant across from me, and he's turning green. I kept saying, hey, look out the window. Look out the window. Don't worry about it in here. Look out the window. You'll be okay. And I could see he was going to throw up, so I just put a bucket over there. And when he did, about four or five of their other guys did. Needless to say, we got to Castle Blake. So, we walk in to uh, this transportation officer, and you got a big ledger out there with a line on it, and you hand him your orders, and he writes your name down. And he's writing these names down, and I hand him my orders, and you look at, oh, hey, you're a first lieutenant. I said, I am? What's these gold bars? He says, here's your orders. You've been promoted. Same thing with a navigator. Don is a flight officer. He comes home, he's still a flight officer. Of course, he is a regular officer instead of a reserve officer, but so what? Here he is leading the second element, and I mean, you know, he should have been brought over us long ago. Ah, not right. Anyway, that happened. So now, Don and uh, Lockheed Hudson, the navigator, and I, we're first lieutenants, man. We're up there. So he gets about, this guy gets all our crew down there, and about two or three or four other guys are standing there and giving their orders, and he put them down, and a phone rings, he pick up, yeah, how many? Okay, let me see. And he puts a big black line about eight or ten names above ours. What's that mean? He said, oh, from that line down they're going to fill a boat. The other guys are flying home on these converted B-24s. They're Navy single tail B-24, big B-24, they have two rudders and all that. But these, the Navy had a single tail job and it was smoother. But they were flying them home. Now we got to fill this boat. Oh, come on. You're not serious. He says, yeah, and it'll take about four, five, six days. Okay, so we're staying in Casablanca. So we go to Caspa. We're not supposed to. <laughs> but we went to Caspa, and that's something else. I, I bought some uh, real perfume. Not, it is, it wasn't been uh, cut down with alcohol or nothing. I, what he had been, he'd been a, a perfumer in a World Fair in Chicago umpteen years ago. And here he was in Caspa and he was selling perfume. So I bought three bottles, I think. I don't know whatever happened to him. But we're watching a fella and he's making a, a layout for, uh, goes on a lady's dresser, dressing table, you know. 
like this, all silver, and he's inlaying gold stripe design by hand. Oh. And the comb and the brush. Oh, and he's going to sell this, I don't know how much. But all by hand. Also, you walk down the street and here's a, a push cart full of beef, just big chunks of beef. And these Arab women picking them up, looking at them, and the flies. Oh, man, that cat pie is something else. But it was interesting. We learned a lot. Let's see, where am I here? Okay, so we get on this ship and it takes off and they have a, a seaplane follow us out away watching for uh, subs and it's a brand new ship on its maiden voyage so we get shooting the breeze with the captain and he says oh yeah I said we're gonna open it up two or three times just see what it'll do they want to know and make a report and uh, he says uh, we're going fast enough he says the sub will have to have to surface to shoot us at all and he says, we got guns to shoot back and we never did see one, but I hope we didn't. But he's making this zigzag course, not not the same way every time, but he has to end up on a course. And so we go one or two this way, maybe, and one or two or three or four or whatever. But it took us, I forget how long now. Must have been a week. Long time. We get off at Newport News. And at the bottom of the ramp is a Red Cross. They hand each one of us a quart of milk and donuts or something else. Anyway, and then we get there and we're going to get on a train and it goes across the U.S. to California, but it stops every other, I think every state is stopped somewhere, <laughs> letting people off. <laughs> so we get back to uh, California, we have a 30-day delay en route to Galveston, Texas instructor school. Going to make us instructors. Okay, fine. So we get on, and we're in a hotel on uh, the beach right down in LA, uh, San Pedro, a uh, big hotel. And down in the basement, they had uh, one-armed bandits and, you know, all kinds of illegal Casino stuff. Casino stuff. Yeah. Huh? At that time, that was no way. So anyway, uh, we have this R&R &R at the hotel, my wife and I, and uh, then when we get home, my sister-in-law, who now lives in my old house where she bought it, and anyway, she was driving a 1939 Chevy two-door that was terrible. I mean, uh, maroon only, it was surface rust maroon, and ball tires, you couldn't buy tires without tickets, and she couldn't get any tickets, so they're ball tires, I mean, all four of them, they spare, forget it, and if you, in Inglewood, they had streetcar tracks yet, and if you go down tracks, front end will start doing this, so I, I said, well, uh, the engine run good, didn't use any oil, and I said, oh, I'll give you this much for it. I don't know what it was. And so she wrote her husband at that time, a different husband, and he was in the Pacific, and told him what I'd said, and he said, sell it to me. Okay, so I bought it. I took it to Phoenix Chevrolet, downtown LA, and had it painted a real pretty blue. Uh, oh, I first took it to this friend of mine. He'd been a World War I airplane mechanic, and he opened a garage. I went to school with his son, and I told him about the front end doing this thing, and he said, well, let's check it out. So he got under there, and he comes out. Hey, Bill, you got eight cents? What do you mean eight cents? He says, well, there's four bushings in there that are gone. I'll replace them, and I'll bet it's going to be fine. He did, and I think this is not <laughs> fix it, eight cents. And so I went, I also bought five retread tires. And it was pretty good shape by then. So then I had to go to Galveston, Texas, to instrument school. And we took off, and 
I don't know how far I went, but I got a little way and one of them retread, the tread just came off. So I had to buy another one. I didn't have any tickets to get them. And so I went to Galveston, Texas, and that was the instructor school. They're going to make all pilots and instructors that go there. That means fighters, uh, bombers, uh, any airplane. They're going to make them instructors. So start, we go ground school for four hours in the morning and flying four hours in the afternoon or vice versa, depending on how you're set up. And my instructor, the first day we go up and he wants me to fly some instruments, and I can't fly instruments worth a hoot. And he said, well, how would you like to go to instrument school? Oh, yeah. So my buddy and I, he had a Plymouth convertible. I left my car there with my wife. And he and I took off went to Bryan, Texas, to instrument school. Well, a pilot from the Pan Am, uh, I thought I didn't forget his name. Uh, anyway, he set up this instrument school because the airlines flew instruments. And, knew how. and he set this school up. And we were flying T-6 airplanes for instrument school, which is crazy, but that's what they had. And all this radio equipment and everything, you couldn't turn these things over or do any of that stuff. But they taught us how to fly instruments. I mean, really. So I go back and they assign me the same instructor. We go out and the first day he says, okay, Bill, I'm going to take you out here and get you lost and you take it home. So he takes me out there with the hood up so I can't see out. And all I can see is the instrument. He says, okay, Bill, take us home. So I tune the radios and I listen on, you got that Morse code thing, A and N. And when they get together, it makes a beam, and that's what takes you to the station. So I listen to this minute, and I fly across a certain angle, turn a different angle, time each time I go across. Oh, okay, the station over there. So I turn around, keep moving over, I get on the beam, right down. I could have landed. He says, gosh, you're not the same pilot. I says, yeah, but I've been taught how. So about this time, my stepfather died in California, so I got emergency leave, went home, and come back. And when I come back, they had a deal that once a year, you could take up an immediate member of your family on a flight. Well, I've been checked. They had two of these UC-78s like we had in advance, a pla the fabric and tubing airplane. And I knew the base ops officer. He and I were friends. And he said, okay, Bill, just take your wife up. I fill out all the paperwork and everything. And we fit her with a parachute and get, to get in the airplane. She gets in the right seat and I get in the crank it up take off and I fly around the shore of Houston, all the harbor out there in the boats and everything. Take her out and don't get too close to shore or gunnery bombing range and all that. So I come back to land and it's the middle of summer, just as hot and humid as it can be. And you make a 45 degree the downwind leg and turn downwind and just so you get downwind, you change the prop from low to high RPM for landing. So I pull the power back, raise the props to high, and put the power back, and when I do both engines, <laughs> all kind of funny stuff. What's going on? Well, I'll make a short approach, and I turn and start in, and these engines are just acting up something awful. And I come down land, and I land start rolling along, and both engines quit cold, just stop. I'm right in the middle of it, and here's fighters and bombers and mediums all wanting to land, and Martin's got the runway blocked. So I'm cranking one of them over trying to start it, and here comes this buddy of mine, the base ops officer, and he opens that back door back there, and he reaches in, and he says, hey, Bill, did you try this? Well, there's a wobble pump down here that builds up the pressure in the fuel. He hit that thing about two or three times, that engine fired right off. Oh. And of course, now he had pressure, so the other engine fired up, and I tacked the engine part. What they found out was those airplanes, their carburetor has built-in ice makers 
even in the middle of that summer, as hot as it was, but with all that humidity, all that moisture, it makes its own ice, and it just shuts them up. And so, man, I really felt funny. Well, in B-17, part of your checklist when you're going to do, you flip on all the fuel boost pumps, automatic. This thing, I, of course, I hadn't flown it since, what, early 42? <laughs> late 42. Anyway, hadn't flown for a long time, so I didn't even think of carburetor heat. No one put carburetor heat in this temperature. Anyway, that's what happened to that. So, as we leave the base, we pick up a sailor that's bumming a ride, and he always picked him up. He said, oh, did you hear all about the emergency on the base? <laughs> no, didn't hear a thing about it. Oh, man. So, eventually you returned to Inglewood, correct? Well, not now. Not now. No, now from Galveston, uh, when I graduated there, I had my choice of where I wanted to go in the Gulf Coast mm -hmm. Command, and Sioux City, Iowa looked like the best. So we were sent to Sioux City, Iowa as an instructor, and it was crews like getting a prior to combat training, and all of us guys that came back to combat are doing the training. And so we, well, we did a lot of work there. Uh, I don't know how to go tell any story. One time we took off and there was a big snowstorm. And this crew, of course, these crews were all pretty new people. You know, they, they were still crews like when I first got to be a co pilot. And we'd gone up to the Sykeston. South Carolina? Not Sykeson. Anyway, there was a bombing gunnery range, and this crew had to do some shooting at the, at the targets and stuff. And so we started home in this snowstorm and moved in to Sioux City. And we're in the soup. And I kept telling you, when you got this radio on, as you're getting closer to the station, the volume will just start coming up. I said, when you hear that volume going to fast, turn 45 degrees for 30 seconds and back on the old head. And just about then, the engineer says, look, and here's the tallest radio station in Yankton, South Dakota, and we're headed right at it. I just reached up and went around it. And I said, okay, I got it. And I went down, because now we found out some of our radios had gone out, and they couldn't hear us, we could hear them. So I went down to the Missouri River and followed it around. I thought, well, I'll come around, it goes right around the end of the runway, and I'll just come up and land. But then I hear all these other airplanes calling in to come in. Whoa. Okay. You take it, head straight west, and climb up till we get out of the clouds. And then turn east and go to St. Paul, is that the double town? What is St. Paul, Minneapolis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we went there, and it turned out six of us went there that night that couldn't get in at Sioux City. So the next day we flew back formation. It was a clear day, the storm went on by. And we had, it just dumped snow all over our plane. We had to get it for cleaning the snow off and everything. And we go and taxi out, and then my buddy says, okay, I'm going to lead today. He says, so he's the first one to take off. We taxi out this runway, and there's about two or three inches of snow. I hadn't cleaned it off. He says, ah, that's no sweat. He pours a cold to He gets clear to the end of that runway, and there's a taxiway. And just as he started that taxiway, he got airborne. So I taxied out and put this guy's wheels right in his track. And we just went and took a normal takeoff and went back. And then in October 6, 1945, I was released from active duty. The war was over. When the war was over, we were sitting in a theater on the base. My wife and I and my son was born there in Sioux City. And we're sitting in a the theater and all of a sudden, the movie stops, the lights all come on. The war is over, and loud over the microphone. And oh man, then they wasn't going to leave us. We lived in town, had a house in town. 
and they weren't going to let us leave the base. What the heck? The war's over. How? Why are you keeping it on base? We live in town. <laughs> so I had to show him, and they let us go by him. Okay, so that was October 6, 1945, and I went back to work with my dad doing cement work again, and uh, my uncle was on the Los Angeles Police Department, and he talked me into trying out for that. And uh, after the written test, there was 4,400 of us took the original written in L.A. There was that many guys who wanted to get on the LAPD. Mm -hmm. I went to Hollywood High School. You went to the nearest one to your home, one my home was Inglewood, and that was the closest one. Then there was two other high schools, and the Inglewood High School, or the Hollywood High School when I went, were four breasts, went down one block, and another to get in to take the written. <laughs> and past that, then we had a, well, I gotta tell you this story. Uh, to get on the LPD, they had a um, physical course, and then they had a physical agility test. Well, one of them, I don't know how this was all come about, but they had a platform that was about this high off the floor, and stand like this, the table part was just about here, just about there. And they had pieces of railroad track welded on another piece that made 25 pounds. They had two up here, one down there. And you'd take one off here, set it down, pick this one up, put it up here. Well, I'd been doing this cement work <laughs> and putting 50 pound bags of cement up in the truck and taking it down and stuff. So I'm going, da, 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 da. I get all done. There's a behind each one, I had about four of these, and behind each one of us, I had a gal counting how many you do in three minutes. And I get done, and she looks up and she says, I don't know how you did it. That's the most we've ever had. And I turn around looking, and there's a fella, he must have been selling shoes or uh, working at a store or something, and he is struggling to get it up. I mean, he pulls it up this way and he... <laughs> I felt so sorry for that guy. And another thing was we went in the gym and we're doing sit-up. And another fella, I, we did, I don't know how long, we did so long and they said, okay, that's good. And he and I are still... <laughs> yeah. But I was in super shape then, man. Another thing they had, they put a meter in your hand and you gripped it. It got your grip pressure. So I gripped this thing and the guy looks at me. Wait a minute, he zeroes it out for the back. Do that again. Oh, we haven't had one that high. How's your left hand? <laughs> but I've been pounding nails and saw and saw, you know, I'm in good shape. So anyway, I get on LAPD, and uh, my first job on the Los Angeles, that was 1949. My first job was walking the beaten Watts, and that was before the Watts riots. And they put me down there with a fellow named Coleman, and all of them down there, we're in full uniform, they'd send four of us down there, and 103rd Street for about six or eight blocks and about a block each side, the people around there, 90% were animals, they weren't people. But you get another block away, and those people are just like you and me and us, they want to live their life, they want you to leave them alone, you know? They're just like us, well, they're black, so what? But these people on here in Third Street, oh man, they're different. Every Friday and Saturday, we knew we was going to have three or four knifings or more and a shooting or two, maybe. You know, it's just that was terrible at that time. And now I'm talking 49, early, real early 50. Anyway, uh, we went on that way, and uh, I forget really how long it was. Uh, I, I worked radio cars and worked the desk a few times, and they'd assign you all kinds of duties. And then I uh, applied and got on motors, and I rode motors for uh, six years total. But 
in 19, June 29, 1953, I got recalled to active duty now in the U.S. Air Force. And I was sent to Mather Air Force Base, Sacramento. And I walk in the door and here's another LAPD walks in the door at the same time. I didn't even know his name is Bill. Come on. Real good. He lives in San Antonio right now. Not San Antonio, uh, El Paso. Uh, I've been down there two or three times, so. He named Bill, big red haired guy. And uh, we were both assigned to Sacramento. Well, everybody walks in the door and hand them their orders. You're putting a B 25 second. You're going to fly B 25 right now. Until there's an opening in either the Convair 2 engine, it's a, a navigator training base, is what Mather was then. And either an opening in the Convair 2 engine or the TB 50 4 engine. I said, Well, if it doesn't have four engines, not an airplane. So I said, B 50s for me. And so as soon as there was an opening in the TB-50, and Mather was the only place in the world that had TB-50s or any kind of B-50 at that time. Now I'm talking uh, early 53, let's see, June, no, middle of 53. And after just a little while, because of my background as an instructor in a B-17 and the training I had, some instrument school and all that stuff, uh, I ended up as an instructor pilot on the B-50 ground school simulator in the aircraft, and <clears throat> we flew 10-hour missions every day, except the weekend, and uh, it was training navigators, the whole thing. Then uh, all of a sudden they said, well, uh, air weather service around the world is changing over from B-29 to B-50. So we need instructor pilots to go <coughs> to one or more of them, those places around the world. Well, around the world they had, what's the island off the east coast? Uh, Bermuda, Bermuda was one of the bases. England, uh, Guam, Alaska, Japan, where else? Maybe that was it. I think that was probably it. Anyway, uh, in the meantime, I had, uh, I think my father died. Uh, no, not yet. For some reason I had to leave for a while. So when I come back, I'm walking on the, to the line, they said, oh, hey, Bill. Uh, you're going to Japan. I said, well, how'd that come about? Oh, they picked names out of a hat. And then, so they sent three instructor pilots to each place. So I went to Japan, and to get there, I flew on a C-97, and they made me the courier officer. So I had to carry a 45 automatic and protect this classic stuff until whenever we land somewhere, I'd have to have the, uh, the uh, intelligent people sign before I could leave the airplane. And so I got over there and I go down to the, it's a 56 weather recon squadron in Tokyo, or in Yokota, Japan, Yokota Air Base. And I walk in and I say, how do I get my family over here? And they said, well, you have to get housing for them. How do I do that? Well, some of the people have to live off base on, in Japanese areas, you know. And they said, well, we just heard that the principal for the school got fired, and he had contracted for one of these houses they're building on base. What's these houses on base? Well, you have to go down to the civil guys that build them. Oh, okay, how do I get there? Well, it's at the fire in the base. I don't have a car or nothing. I said, my car's on the way. Oh, borrow my bike, go down this street and that street and go and talk to them. So I do. I whiffle down there. I walk in and start talking to him. He shows me this map. What it is, 
the on base housing right at the base is on the base. But you got the back gate, turn right and go about a mile and turn left and here's another acreage, quite a big acreage, with these two story buildings that's all on base housing. And there's a road goes around back like this, goes cars around behind them. They're building these houses that are just a little bigger than their two car garage. But there's three bedroom houses. The bedroom is about four feet square, I guess. Anyway, they're building these houses. So he starts talking to me, I said, well, how do I get one? He says, well, you can give us a deposit or give us 2800 bucks and it's yours. <clears throat> okay, so I sent home and get the money sent. In the meantime, I found out there's no water heater, there's no porches. Wait a minute. So about six of us, I forget how many they're building out there. About six of us got together. We had to go down down to Tokyo, and there's a place there that'll make you a 50 gallon tank. We go to Sears and Roebuck, and we get electric heaters for water heaters, and you put one toward the bottom and one toward the about in the middle. And it's all thermostat the whole bit. And the thing about living on base was that the electricity and the water and all that is there. You don't have to carry your water and the electricity is not weird because out on the thing your washer or your nothing would work right because it's different. So, different. Yeah, completely different. So I thought that's a good deal. So then I also talked to him, I had him build a small porch, I got pictures of it here, a small porch and uh, a place to park my car because it was going to be a mud in the wintertime there. So they put a gravel place for my car. And so we moved in there and then uh, later uh, when I was assigned there, we flew WB-50s and uh, B-29s, and how it worked out was Bill West and Bill Martin flew together. Bill West was an instructor in 29, I was an instructor in 50. So if we're flying a B-29, Bill's taking me out, we're flying a 50, I'm taking him out. So this day we're taking off in a B-29. And <clears throat> so I'm in the left seat, Bill's in the right seat, give me instruction, teach me how to do this. And that day, the weather was beautiful, which is rare around Tokyo, really. But it was a beautiful day. So we whistle down the runway and take off. And we go out, there's a place called Chosi Point. And it's their weather service. Always flew at an absolute 10 down feet, if, if possible. And <clears throat> the weatherman in the nose had all these precision instruments. And if you get over 50 feet off, you start losing points. 50 feet, that's not much. So anyway, I take off and climb out. We always go over Trusty Point at exactly 50 in our feet because it drops as you go over, it drops right to the ocean. So it's sea level. And that's when the weatherman checks everything real quick. So I'm just starting to turn the head that way and the scanner says, Sure, the right main gear isn't all the way up yet. And I see that, I said, yeah, and the red light's on the gear. And, uh, no, Bill West, he says, well, okay. He says, we'll level off here. And you get up in there, there's an emergency crank. He says, you get up in the bomb bay and get your headset on. We'll pull the circuit breaker and turn the switch off on the gear so it won't move or nothing. And you crank it down, we'll have to go back and get another airplane. We're having a long day. Because we're looking at a 10-hour mission anyway. So, <clears throat> we start flying around. The next thing we hear, okay, I'm in here with the headset and uh, everything off of there. Yeah, it's off. Next thing we hear, I won't say a word he said, but, uh, oh, something. And uh, Bill says, what's wrong? He said, well, I've got the, the, you pull the T-handle, and what it did, when you pull the T-handle, it, the electric motor's on the outboard side. It declutches it, and then clutches in the emergency clutch so you can crank it down. And there's a lot of turns in between there. 
He said, I got that TM out of Fargo, and he said, I have no resistance on a crank either direction. But I said, whoop, I'll be right back. He said, and he told me, he says, hey, you call the tower and tell them to get the 56th weather commander, the maintenance officer, uh, exec officer, all out of bed and get them up there in the tower. Yes, we got a problem. And the Boeing tech rep, because they were changing over from B-29s to B-50s, we had a Boeing tech rep there. And tell him bring all his B-29 information. So they start that. And Bill goes back. And to get from the front to the back in a 29 or 50, you get in a tunnel on a little cart. Uh, that's four little wheels on track. And you lay down on that and give yourself a push, and you get uh, that's how it stays. Uh, uh, oh, stays uh, level? No. <laughs> Can't think of where. There's that 87 year old head again. Uh, the, the pressure is pressurized. Okay. If you're so pressure, I so you can breathe out oxygen mass and all that. And oh, okay. I have to. Okay. And that's how they do it. The tunnel is pressurized along with the back and the front. They don't mm. have to do it to Bombay or nothing. Okay. And so he goes back, and the next thing I know, he says, Bill, this thing isn't going either way. He says, We got our foot up against the bulkhead. We're both pulling on a T gun. Nothing happened. We found out later that the Mercy clutch on the in, on the inboard side had a crack in the housing, and when they pulled the T handle, the torque holding that electric motor when it pulling the gear up was so great it wouldn't declutch because this crack it just opened the crack, <laughs> so you could crack it down. So anyway, and I got pictures of all that here somewhere about this B twenty nine build. The two builds are gonna crash that twenty nine. And it was on a Saturday. Normally on Saturday, everybody on base that doesn't have an assigned job, they've gone somewhere else. They don't want to get called in. And everybody, I think, heard about the two bills are going to crash land at B-29. So everybody stayed on base. The division commander drove out from Tokyo. And it was, oh, a good hour's drive or better. And he drove out there to see this thing. In the meantime, my wife had seen in the paper where a real good friend of her, her girlfriend was bowling over at the next base. So she's going to go over there and see her. And she hadn't seen her for, I don't know, five, six years. So as she's going around the end of the runway, I'm flying about this high off the ground, and we're throwing throwing out anything we can that's heavy, get rid of any weight we can. And our airplanes were very distinctive. They had what we call a shoebox on top. And I can tell you now, then it was top secret stuff. But what it was was it had filters you could take and put up in there. And out on the wings we had what looked like fuel tanks and the back half was, but the front half had a big hole and a filter. And when a Russian set off an atomic test bomb, if we found it in the air, we stayed in it and got all we could. And they'd analyze what mm -hmm. kind it was and all that. So she sees this B-29, and this is not normal, man. <laughs> That's Africa. And we're throwing this up. And what happened? We had a brand new second lieutenant navigator. And the weatherman, old Barton was his name, he must have weighed 225 pounds. The second day and probably weighed 125 soaking wet. He had a 24-foot backpack, 28-foot backpack. The weatherman had a 24-foot. He's twice as heavy, well, not quite, but almost. <laughs> anyway, uh, the bill gives the crew the option if anyone wants to bail out. That's up to you. We're going to bring it in. We're going to crash land it. And uh, so Barton and this second lieutenant decide they'd bail out. Okay, fine. So being a clear day, that helped a lot. It was smooth. And they had uh, 
uh, been plowing both sides of the runway off the runway to make it drain better. So it wasn't draining right in some spot. And they had been plowing, so the ground was pretty soft on each side, and we went over the, that area. So we come around, and they're going to go out to Bombay, because that's the biggest place to jump out. And we come up, and we get right to the end of the runway, and we say, okay, jump. And the second lieutenant went, now, Bill Barton, he's standing there looking out, looking out, he don't jump. We're almost to getting the other end, we're going to tell him, don't jump, and he goes. So he goes, 24 foot shoot, 225 pounds, lands in the dirt, looks up, here's the second lieutenant floating across the base. He goes out past the base, ends up in the rice paddy. Well, you know what they use for fertilizer in Japan for rice paddy? <laughs> Humans. So anyway, two other pilots of ours in a big convertible they had, they were going around and they saw this, and so they went and helped him get out of the rice paddy. In the meantime, my wife goes over to, I can't think of the name of the base anyway, and saw this friend her come back and she had a, a made an appointment to pick up three other officers' wives and go bowling at our bowling alley because we were all into bowling. And she has these other three gals in the car and they're going on, and here's this parachute. My wife, oh, hey, look at this parachute. Oh, I don't see no parachute. No, that's not a parachute. And everybody on base knew the two buildings are crash landing people. And they're trying not to have my wife know it. And my two kids are in the base theater going to show. And the kids in there are talking about this. And the kids knew I was flying, you know. Anyway, uh, quite as, the story. As you can see from the pictures, uh, we come in, land, and of course, Bill, being the instructor on 29, we'd switch seats. He's back in the left seat doing the flying. And we come down. Oh, the only guy hurt in this whole thing was the engineer because his hatch was not a window, it was just a hatch. It had never been open. He turned the handle and he pulled out and it won't come loose. Then it came loose, wham, and it caught him right across the forehead. He's the only guy I heard. Anyway, uh, we come in and test down and Bill did a beautiful job, boy. He, and they put foam on that side of the runway. He put the left main gear and the nose gear there. And we're giving it more and more air on to keep that wing up as long as we can. Finally, I could hear that outside prop. And at that time, we had shut everything off. There's a emergency, one emergency uh, switch that shuts off all electric in the whole airplane. And that was all planned. This is just we level off at that time. He said, now, and the engineer hit that. And we're coming down, and then I can hear the wingtip start scraping on the ground. And the airplane's starting to swerve, and we're both pushed on the rudder and holding our thing. And Bill says, okay, here we go. And he pushed his right rudder and goes all the way over with it. And the airplane starts around this way. And to me, I can just see that left main gear collapsing with all the weight on it going around and coming there and ripping the wing off or whatever. <laughs> and it didn't. It held. But it made two jumps like this and stopped off the runway, and they had sent some fighters to another base thinking we might uh, block the runway or whatever. And uh, they're on alert, these fighters all the time. So we get stopped, and Bill said, I turn around and look and said, let's get the hell out of here. And he said, all I see is your feet leaving the window, <laughs> and the guys in the back are gone. They're out running. I can see them, and I'm chasing them. The first guy in that airplane was the base commander. He had a Buick staff car. They said he made a four-wheel drift onto the <laughs> runway and full bore, and he was the first guy there. Well, what they found out, they found this crack in the emergency side, and it weakened that, and the uh, electric gear pulling that gear up with so much torque on it, it wouldn't let go. Go ahead. That's what caused the beach on angry. Quite, and he made the papers. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got pictures and all that. Uh, I'll go into the beast. Uh, C-119 I save here in a minute. But anyway, 
Uh, then some things happened there, and so I decided, okay, I'm going to get a release from active, uh, active duty and go back to LAPD. That was in May 1957. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to LAPD got back on motors, and in February '59 was when I was hired as a GS-12 for the Air Reserve Technician Program, and that was at Long Beach Airport. I was the second pilot hired, and <coughs> uh, they were just changing over from C-47, C. Yeah, I can think of the airplane. Shoot, a big. It was like a C-46 or so big, and that was it, C-46, and they had just changed it over from that to a C-119, which is a twin-engine troop carrier, and all that, and so we started flying those at Long Beach Airport. That was our first assignment, Long Beach Airport, and. All the reservists around the whole LA area, and then some came there. And uh, it was Federal Civil Service running the Air Force Reserve. And uh, then later, let's see, no, first, uh, let's see, what was the first? Anyway, on this time I'm talking about saving the C 119, we went to Alaska. Uh, 14. 14 airplanes, and I was in charge, and my navigator, oh, what was his name, real nice guy, he and I together were in charge of these 14 airplanes, and it was a combination Air Force Army exercise. We were going to take them out to a field out there in the wintertime, and they were going to work. Okay. We got done with this two weeks active duty thing and started home. Well, coming home, we're going to go down and stop in Washington at uh, Navy Island there. But if anybody needs fuel or anything, they stop at the island. Here we go again. Whidbey Island or Bellingham? That area? Uh, Whidbey is where we're going to stop in Washington. But this other one's about halfway. And if somebody had calculated they didn't have enough fuel to get to Washington, they'd stop there and fuel. And it was night, and we're in the soup, and we had been the last airplane to take off because we had a, a analyzer, engine analyzer. So if anybody had trouble, we could analyze it first and all that. So we took off last, and so I had been up all day. I got up real early. So when we got on there, the pilot. I had checked out and while we were there, and the co-pilot, and his name was Doug Howard was the pilot that I checked out. Real nice guy. He's passed away since. Uh, and the other guy was I can't remember his name. We checked him out as co-pilot. Anyway, they were in the seat because I'd gone down in the back to rest. We had 21 guys on board with us, and their garbage in the middle of their luggage and all that. And I come back up and I said, well, how are we doing? Uh, anybody stopping for fuel? And he said, yeah, a couple of them are. And so how are we doing? Said, nah, we're fine. We're going, we're going on. And uh, I said, well, I'll go down there about 30 more minutes and I'll come up and we'll switch seats. So it's time to switch seats. Okay, fine, you So I go down and I step over this baggage just all down the middle. I just go to sit down on this uh, canvas strong line or sit on and that airplane started shaking. Oh man, never have I had an airplane. I mean it's just shaking something terrible. So I jump over this and the guy in the copa is sitting on my parachute. So I grab this pair of parachute and here I'm putting it on and I look down here these twenty one guys see the aircraft commander on a parachute, and her eyes are like this, and this airplane is just shaking something off. Well, to get up in the pilot, you got to get up about, oh, this high, and there's a ladder type, just rung, and I couldn't get a hold of them, so I just jumped up on there. 
And I look out the left window, there's sparks and all kinds of stuff around that left engine. So I know it's the left engine. So I get up there and I grab Doug, behind Doug's seat and I says, what's going on? He says, I don't know. And I could see that he hadn't gone to meter power yet, which he should have done right away. And I says, Andy, Andy, he was the other guy's name. I said, get out of there and let me in that seat. So I jump in the seat. And I saw Doug as I got up here, pulled the prop lever back to feather, and it made it worse. I said, leave it ahead. And so I jumped in the seat, and I said, I got the airplane, Doug, see what you can do with that engine. And I saw he was drifting off course, and there, luckily they had put an ILS, which is an instrument landing system, in the island, and just a week before then had started working and it was tuned in luckily in the outer marker and I could see he was driven left and there's hills and mountains all around over there and we're in the soup and this thing is shaking it's shaking so bad the instrument panel is going back and hitting on each side and every time it hit on the right side it would flash electric flash luckily it didn't do any damage there anyway I Mainly went to Mito Power to get more power and started back over to the center line. And Doug reached up and he said, I'm going to feather that mm -mm -mm engine. He goes, wham. Well, the engine at that time, I'm almost sure, was just about to seize because he had gone through the feather procedure, which is shut off the oil and gas. So no oil to get into the engine. It's got to be in the and so when he come back and I think feathered, I started breathing because now it'll fly on one engine like conditions we were in, pretty good. And I got over there and anyway we landed. And when we got down and opened the side door to get out, it started sprinkling and I could hear the, the engine was so hot it was going psh, psh, psh. I said, everybody get away from the airplane. This thing is so hot. It, Mike, that's on fire. Well, we all ran away from the airplane for a while, and of course let it go cool off. And then several other, the airplane ahead of us came back, and there was a couple of them there getting gas, and we split all these 21 guys up in their stuff and took them home in the other airplane. But that's what happened with that one. And uh, one time we had, uh, we used to go back to Fort Campbell, Kentucky and drop paratroopers to 119. And uh, one time we were dropping down El Centro. At the, there was a big Navy base there and Navy uh, gunnery range and uh, drop paratroopers and the whole bit out there in the desert. So we're going down there and the 82nd Airborne is going to have a big exercise. And we had VIPs out there, I'm saying, watching. And we're coming in, and we have a, a always a safety officer on the ground, and this general in charge of the 82nd Airborne, and the wind was blowing too hard. And our guy says, cancel it, we're, kind of, we're not going to drop him. This general says, I order you to drop them. The 82nd Airborne is tough, they're okay. Okay, man, we dropped them. And Four or five of our airplanes landed and acted as aerovac because the guys had broken legs, broken arms, and they were in dress uniforms. And their uniforms were all tore up. I don't think any of them didn't have a uniform tore up. And that's general. And then he used to drop the heavy equipment. Trucks, jeeps, they'd hit and that parachute and that wind would just drag it across. Desert, and one of them missed the IP stand by 10 feet. Maybe. So, you know, there's too much. Anyway, then, uh, let's see, when was it? Uh, that was February 59, Harder, Long Beach. And then we got shipped to March Air Force Base. And Changed over, we still flew C-119s there for a while, then we switched over to C-124s. And C-124s are a little shaky, and we flew all over the world in that. I went to France, I went to uh, Vietnam three times, go in 
haul stuff in and out. And uh, went to Alaska. I saw my daughter up in Alaska, and uh, her she was uh, her husband at that time was in uh, I think he was Air Force, but he was a enlisted guy, and he was a jerk, pardon my French. But uh, anyway, we went on that. Uh, yeah, I was talking about where we had the 14 airplanes. I almost lost that one. And I ended up there. Uh, actually, I ended up as operation officer for all four squadrons in the group, or three squadrons at March. Our fourth squadron was up in uh, Salt Lake City, just north of Salt Lake City. Well, Air Base up there. Just north of Salt Lake City. Okay. That was our other squadron. We had to go up there and check them on once in a while. Anyway, I ended up as operation officer for all three of those. Then I was assigned as a group assistant director of operations. And that's where I ended up in the art program. Mm. I transferred over on 10 September 67 to the Federal Aviation Administration. And I was at Glendale Airport at that time in the FAA office, and I was assigned to, I forgot what airline then, they assigned you to an airline, and you're in charge of checking all the pilots and their training and so forth. And uh, that was in 1970, and it was just a transfer from the Federal Aviation to, from the Air Reserve Technician to the FAA, because they're both civil service. It was just a transfer. Okay. And I was one of the last ones from the 452nd to go to the FAA. But anyway, in the, after, uh, for a while I was there at the Burbank Airport, and then I was assigned to the training center, the FAA training center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, which is headquarters for the FAA. And uh, when I first got there, I walked in there, and this man in charge of operations says, Okay, Bill, I want you, and there was an engineer there, to set up a DC-6 operation. He said, We got a lot of DC-6s coming in, and we need inspectors, so check out Inspector 6s. So he and I sat down, we worked out a training program, flying program, the whole thing, set it all up and started training DC-6. And after a little while, that one long we had other guys working with us and everything, I went over to the Lockheed L-188, uh, which to me was a, a Electra, Lockheed 88 Electra. And to me that was a pilot's Cadillac. Man, that solid airplane, good airplane. When it was first built, it was built just at the wrong time. It was built between recip airplanes, gas-driven prop, to jet airplanes. And the theory was it would have props, but it would have a jet engine. So it would be the best of two worlds. Well, it didn't work out that way. Because the props would get to the speed of sound on the prop depth, <laughs> and you couldn't do any faster than that. Now, two Lockheed Electras, right after they were put in service with the airlines, two brand new airplanes practically just ripped a wing right off. Full of passengers, killed them all. And so, uh, I forgot who it was, somebody said, ground them all. And the head of the FAA at that time said, no, we're not going to ground them all. Well, we restrict them to flying in any known turbulence or restrict them 180 knots max, and we're going to find out what's going on. Something is causing this. So every airline, and I mean foreign airlines even, came to Lockheed and said, anything we got that can help, because they want them too, you can have it. So who was somebody had a thing that they put on a wing tip and it would cause a vibration. and. What they found out was that the engines 
a jet engine on this airplane stuck way out in front and everything turned this way like a gyroscope really a vibration all our planes are vibrate in the air and they're all built to, to stop the vibration you know is the way they're built the electric it come in the wing hit the outboard engine and instead of stopping it, it would make it stronger mm -hmm. It goes the inside engine stronger and just ripped the wing off. So they went up and they put two big braces. Like I said, I was an instructor specialist on my L188. And two big tube pipes that braced up to the engine, put thicker material on certain parts of the wings, and I went up on one one time while I did the test. I had a machine. It'd go over and you'd take it over the metal like this and it would tell you how thick that metal was within hundreds of an inch. If it showed something of that, they had a more, a stronger instrument. They'd take up that and go and get it exact. And then they'd change different panels on the wing or whatever. And Tex Johnson, the test pile for Lockheed, he tried to tear one apart. He, in fact, it was the one we had in Oak City. He took it up here. We have what I call standing mountain wave over the mountains up here where the winds make these terrific sometimes. And he'd dive into them and pull it up and all kinds. Never had another one do it. Never did. And it was such a saw airplane. But it was outdated because of when it was built. It was just, it just didn't do what they thought it would. A good airplane, though, solid. And a lot of them worked out in different ways. Uh, and then you flew for Flying Tigers or worked with Flying no. Tigers? Uh, what happened then, I was sent back to Long Beach Airport FAA office. When I, after three years at Oak City, I came home and was sent in 73 back to uh, Long Beach Airport, and then I was a principal inspector for Air California and McCulloch Airlines. McCulloch has, they got, I don't know how many places, but they got one at uh, Colorado River. Uh, oh, come on. You know where the where the London Bridge is. Oh. Um. <laughs> anyway, they have that area, and they would sell property to people. You know, they own the whole thing, McCulloch, and they what they do, they'd bring people out from the east in the middle of the winter, bring them out there to Laughlin. Laughlin. And. Not Laughlin, the one south. Havasu City? Lake Havasu? Lake Havasu. They bring them down there and they get out of the airplane and here's 70 degrees, beautiful sunshine. Back east is ice, snow, wind. They, oh man, I'm going to buy me a lot out here and retire right here. And they would, they buy that. Then they come out in the middle of the summer. They get off that airplane, they can hardly breathe. Maybe 110, you know, and what did I do? <laughs> but they also had one in Nevada, Alco, Nevada. They had one, boy, one of them was called the Avenue of Fountains. Oh, I know, Scottsdale, Arizona, just outside Scottsdale. Man, they got these beautiful fountains right up in the middle of this street. Must be eight, ten fountains. <clears throat> but they would sell these properties to people, and they did that for a long time. McCulloch also uh, had, uh, the reason I was made inspector with them is they had L-188 airplane, Lockheed Electric. And they would fly these people, they weren't a, a scheduled airline, they were what we call a commercial airline. And they could only fly the people under certain conditions. And one of them, uh, McCulloch Jr., he'd get a bunch on there for a party, uh, tennis matches somewhere, super tennis matches, and they'd have a party on that airplane all the way there and back. 
but it, it was interesting. Then, in Air California, before American Airlines bought them, I flew with them, their chief pilot, and I got to be a real good friend, and their director of operations, and I got to fly every one of their 737s. They took, uh, they, the FAA sent me to Winston-Salem, South Carolina, North Carolina, Winston-Salem, to check out the 737. An airline back there checked out FAA inspectors. So they checked me out, and that's the latest airplane I checked out, and it was Boeing 737. And I retired then in 29 July. Let's see, from the Air Force, it was 29 July 81 on my birthday. Six years old, and December 25, 81, I retired from the FAA. Oh, on Christmas? Yeah. <laughs> that, it's on my thing on the wall in there, my thing. Yeah. But like I said, I, lots of pictures of Africa, Italy, and after, back here, mm -hmm. and all my missions right there. My daughter is going to type these up. When she goes back to South Carolina, she can't right now. She's working too hard at this place in Riverside. But she couldn't type them all up. Well, it's, thank you, Bill. And that was a very interesting 60, 65 year run of yeah, adventures well, all around the world. <laughs>